fantastic. Okay. Um, we're going to go through the agriculture and food security discussion. This is a very interesting one for me. Can I please invite Dr. Shedrick Mupili, who is the CEO and President of Agricultural Research Council. Can I then invite Mr. Leon Filjad? If you are here, please can you come through? He's the Executive Director of Talmar Sustainable Developments. Then can I please have Mr. Tiamo Gichabe, who is the Managing Director for Commercial Agriculture Youth Chamber. And uh, in AFS, we are going to have a representative by the name of Nkutu Mbiko Mutsehwa. Yeah, I, I think I'm right. Who's the chairperson of AFASA National Women's Desk. So if uh, Nkutu can please come through and all our panel members welcome. Can we please welcome them with a round of applause? Okay, Siamo, are you here? Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. All right, we've got exactly 20 minutes, um, 20, 25 minutes for this discussion. So we'll keep it brief. To our panel members, welcome. Thank you so much uh, for allocating time to be with us. What we'll do, perhaps we can just have your opening statement. Um, which organization are you from? What's the organization about? And what is your contribution to agriculture and food security in the African continent and South Africa as well? Thank you. We'll start with you, uh, Dr. Shadrick. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm Shadrach Moepudi. Uh, just for correction. Thank you so much, Doc. Um, I'm with the Agriculture Research Council, um, which is a, essentially uh, a, a public entity that conducts research for in the agriculture sector um, uh, for all the commodities except sugar. Uh, and that is because the sugar industry uh, have their own research uh, station. Um, and the forestry industry also have their own research institute. So everything you see on your plate, we conduct research on uh, as long as we have the capabilities to do so. Um, our research is focused primarily on um, enabling the farmers to be productive in terms of increasing their yields, but also on uh, developing solutions around pests and diseases. Uh, but also providing insights as to identifying the most suitable conditions and under which agriculture production can happen. But beyond uh, primary agriculture, we also do um, secondary you know, uh, uh, research around um, agro-processing, uh, which deals with post-harvest handling, uh, storage, and, and processing of some of the agriculture products uh, for purposes of enabling the farmers to manage and handle the product, uh, both for the market uh, but also for purposes of enabling uh, proper processing to develop new products uh, and get it out there so that the consumers can have, a, have very good um, um, products uh, out there. So we, re we respond to the needs of the sector as and when they wish to see those particular needs and according to their priorities, uh, and that is how we deliver those particular um, um, products. Let, let, let me stop there because uh, we have other issues I can deal with um, uh, in, you know, when, we, when we then discuss. Okay, that's fine. Thank you very much, Doc. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ndutu Mbiko Musahwa. I'm a farmer and I've availed myself to belong to an um, organized culture under AFASA, which stands for African Farmers Association of South Africa. We are an organization that seeks to mobilize, be the voice of the black farmers across the country and within the SADC region to make sure that there's um, proper visibility of capable farmers, those that are aspiring, new role players, uh, progressive farmers, and commercial farmers. Enhance them to an extent that they have a footprint towards our GDP. 
They have a footprint in all the elements of the value chain, both ver vertical and horizontal. As you know, agriculture plays a significant role. It has been for the past few years, contributing towards the GDP of our country. And if you can ask me how many of black people are there, there's less than 0 0,1. So we are in the process of making sure that that changes. We are, in the, we are in the process of making sure that economic transformation as black people, mainly as black women as well, we are part of that. Thank you. Mm. Thank you so much. Yes, ma'am. Um, good day, colleagues. Uh, my name is Kitsia uh, I'm the Managing Director of the Commercial Agriculture Youth Chamber. Um, the chamber was formed in 2006, and the uh, majority of what we've been doing is mainly on lobbying advocacy, um, trying to mainstream youth participation within the sector. Um, at the international level, I'm also the South African representative for YPAD, that's Y Young Professionals for Agricultural Research and Development. Um, at the continental level, we've been providing inputs and support towards the implementation of the, the Malibu proclamation in terms of the CADEP, uh, which is a NEPED program um, for Comprehensive Africa Agricultural Development Program. And then um, at the national level, we've also been providing a lot of inputs with regards to the policies that are aligned to mainstreaming and institutionalizing youth participation in the sector including uh, the Integrated Youth Development Strategy, um, the National Youth Accord, but also currently we are working very closely with the Department of Agriculture, Forestry and Fishery in the development of the draft uh, comprehensive producer support um, program, which should be adopted hopefully by our parliament in the next couple of months. Sure, phenomenal. Thank you very much. Okay, just to kick start the session, I'll just ask um, one or two questions to the panel and then um, we can then engage further as the audience. Uh, Dr. Muyekule, um, for me, I think the most fundamental thing that I'd need to know is how is your research assisting in food production, particularly for SMMEs um, or people that are looking basically to uh, produce what they consume? Have you had approaches from um, people in the food industry, and also most importantly, are we really looking to be food secure, or are we looking to have food sovereignty? Because food sovereignty says we are in control and we own the means of production. And, and food security is to say, yes, there are taxes and duties involved, and it's just to ensure that people have access to quality food, but that's not enough. Um, so, so maybe we can just um, kickstart the conversation around that discussion. And to, 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 what's your experience with women in farming? If you're saying also, I know you spoke about black participation at less than 0.1%, but at the women's desk, what is the narrative that happens uh, along that platform? And then when it comes to uh, you, Mr. Dichaba, you just told us about you know, a document that is about to be passed in Parliament. What has the youth participation been like? What, are, what have young people have to, day, to say excuse me, about agriculture? Um, what are the struggles, especially when it comes to an access point of view? Because I think I've heard a lot of young people say, we want to be involved, but we don't know how, um, it's too capital intensive, where do we start? So, what are the premises that have formed the policy that you are talking about and that will be presented to cabinet? Okay, are there any questions in the audience regarding this panel discussion? Okay, I'll recognize you, sir, you're number one. I'll recognize you, ma'am, you're number two. You are number three and number four. Let's start with this round, but I see you. I know I owe you from yesterday, ma'am. Right. Okay, we'll start with you, sir. So what we'll do, we'll take all the questions so that we are able to answer once. Okay, yes, sir. Good afternoon, panel. Panel, would you agree that the most environmental challenge that we have in South Africa today is water supply? And that is going to affect, obviously, agriculture directly. Um, given that the majority of the water that we are drinking at the moment in Gauteng is coming from Lesotho, 
Um, the project in Lesotho, Katsidam, is already 15 years behind program in phase two. Mm. We are, as a, a country, water short. We have maximized the amount of dams that we can build. We can't build anymore because we, we only have a certain percentage of rain that I'm sure you all know. Some has got to flow into rivers, some you can buy, some you use for industry, some you use for human population, uh, agriculture, etc. The problem that we are arising, and even in Johannesburg, in the next five years, we are going to have a water shortage in this city, in Johannesburg. Uh, what does the panel suggest? Okay, thank you very much for that. Number two. Good afternoon. Uh, first of all, I want to compliment Dev. I think they're the best run department, actually. Uh, I've great respect for them. My question is, uh, how do you foresee that the uh, Africa Free Trade Agreement will actually assist agriculture and manufacture? And is that a way for s a small SMEs to actually become involved? And then secondly, is there a way for your department to uh, verify the research that's done, for example, by the Sugar Research Institute, because I think you know more than anyone else the pressure that uh, producers of sugar cane is under. And it is largely because of uh, faulty international research on sugar and health issues, which I will not go into now. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Um, Doc, in the climate change that we are experiencing, I think you'd know that um, the maize farmers really have not um, done well this season. Most have not planted much hectare as compared to other seasons. Um, in your research and, and, and obviously um, the, the work that you do around climate change and, and, and um, that sort, what influence or how are you influencing policies in government um, to sort of move towards um, more of precision farming rather than us, um, our farmers, rather planting and praying for the rain which doesn't quite come or comes very late? What are we, how are you influencing or what are your, um, how's your work sort of influencing the policy makers? And, um, the second question is towards um, Afasa as well as Tiamo. Um, I come from a funding house, um, a DFR, right? And um, one of the challenges that we mostly face when we fund, especially in the agri space, is that, um, sure, um, we've got a lot of um, people wanting to come and, and, and access our funding, but you'll find that the skills then are, 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 quite, are not quite there, the farming skills, the marketing skills. How is AFASA as well as the, the chamber sort of um, integrating themselves where, in, where skills are concerned um, as well as aligning themselves to these funding houses because we are just that, we are funding houses. We don't quite have um, the expertise to train or whatnot. We, we, we may source, but our primary um, sort of um, uh, 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 basis of what we do is funding. Sure. So, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, sister. Okay. Question number four. Good afternoon. My question is for the doctor and also for Afasa. We have a lot of informal farmers in the townships and in the rural areas. Mm. My question is, have you guys done a research in terms of the database of how many people do we have and also what are the interventions to bring them to to formal to formal um, farming and there's also programs that are funded by the likes of cedar for an example in Limpopo there's one it's a cooperative that they are farming grapes but I just want to know if Will those people ever get to a point whereby they supply maybe a wine manufacturer or what are there, is there any integration between all these government agencies to talk to each other in terms of the 
what is happening in the sector. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Sir, I'm in the red shed. Can you just uh, ask your question? And I think we'll, we'll, we'll leave it at yours. Are there any other questions, maybe? So people don't feel I'm excluding them. Okay, so we'll take the last two, okay? So it's you and then the last two. All right. Mm -hmm. Hello, uh, my name is George. Uh, I want to ask the panel, well, as much as we're talking about growth, uh, empowering SMEs in okay. the agriculture, my question is, uh, I want to know that since we are not eating the quality food that are coming from this agriculture, the GMOs, which yes. are practically the source of so many diseases that today yes. that are dying from, what form of methods have you actually put in place to try to improve the type of food that we eat yeah. that are actually threatening our lives on a daily basis? That's a powerful question. We must just go to Venda, eh? That's easier there with the crop and food. Really. Okay, um, yes, sir, and then we'll end with you. Yes. You. Okay, good day, everyone. My name is Lai Kisitole. I'm from Department of Correctional Services and the Agriculture Section. Uh, we are producing vegetables for self-sufficiency okay. for the offenders. Then my question is directed to ARC. I just want to know what are the chances for them to come and uh, conduct research uh, from the vegetables that we're producing? Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Last question. Thank you. Um, I didn't hear the question um, from the gentleman in the red, so, but I've got a feeling that our questions might be similar, but I'll just be quick anyway. Well, if you are a warden at a correctional services, then uh, it would probably be the same question. Okay, no. <laughs> I'm joking. No, sorry. Go ahead. Um, so my concern is that our um, food is getting a bit less um, healthy. It's got a lot of GMO and... Sure. Um, everything in there. So I'm wondering whether the research that's being done and the integrity thereof, are you training the people to um, maintain that integrity mm. and so that we can trust our food? And I'm thinking um, large farmers, they're doing this mass production thing. And I'm also thinking about the question the lady with the beautiful blue headband had. Um, why don't we empower the smaller people in the townships to produce more fresh vegetables, mm. fruits, everything to local environments, then we also have a better food integrity and we know everything is fresh and healthy and it's not um, farmed wherever far. Sure. And yeah, so it's just a, it's a combination of empowerment and food integrity question, if you can please. That's a very important that. question you're asking because actually our townships now, we used to have grass and everything, now there's cement. People are busy with double stories and putting cement as if it's fashionable. So you're thinking about parking and not your stomach. You know, very sad. Okay, to the panel. <laughs> the, the doctor is just thinking, yeah, this lady is very crazy. But um, please go ahead, doc. Please include your final remarks uh, as you answer the questions. Thank you. Thanks. I was, going to, I was trying to negotiate with my colleague here to say ladies first, but she's refusing. So don't say I didn't try. Um, yeah, maybe, maybe let me briefly start by indicating that um, uh, in the Agriculture Research Council, we do a lot of training, uh, education and training. We have a number of short courses, and I think one of the ladies that got a hamper here, what's her name, Tembi? Oh, she's here. Mm, she the one she, she runs a number of those, uh, those training courses that are actually uh, which these are short training courses mm. that are accredited, okay. um, uh, that are dedicated to the different sectors in the, agri in the, in the agriculture sector. They are, they are focused around production, they are focused around uh, uh, achieving certain technical know-how in order for you to do certain things on your farm, but also to help farmers sometimes. Um, but then we also have uh, fairly uh, high-level courses where we have uh, um, about 300 uh, students that are doing their PhD and master's degrees in the ARC. Uh, now, why in the ARC? Because the manner in which we do our, our training is very different if, you know, at, the, at that level. It's applied rather than theoretical. Okay. So they get a, a master's degree, uh, say, on something that has to do with animal uh, production or animal reproduction, which is a lot more applied than it is a theory. Um, this year alone, we graduated about 57 students with, with master's degrees wow. um, and 10 with, uh, with PhDs. 
uh, on an average, on, on average, we graduate about 15 with PhDs and about 20 with master's degrees. Uh, and then we also train our own staff mm -hmm. as an organization. We've got about 3,000 3, staff uh, for a number of things in, in a number, like any organization, um, soft skills, uh, people management for them to be functional accounting and so on uh, through a variety of different service providers so at a minimum just globally um, those are some of the things we do you can visit our booth they can probably give you more details around that let me now focus on the um, on the questions that were raised from the floor um, you know the debate around food secure versus food se food sovereignty is actually an economic debate than it is an actually a scientific debate okay so it's a debate actually that is also political in nature because it's a debate in the world in the world trade organization sure that's true so from where i'm sitting um i, I think it's important that we we separate the two issues on, on the one hand food security is about the capability to be able to produce food as a country um, but you can still be food secure when you're not producing the food Okay. Uh, I'll give you a very simple example. I don't know how many of you are aware that uh, the UK has not been a major food producer for more than 60 years. True. It depends on importing the food, which means it buys the food. Mm. Um, now, are they food sovereign or not? So you've got to deal and decide with those kinds of issues. Um, but they're dealing with food security. So okay. you've got to actually be very nuanced and, and focused as exactly in terms of your understanding of what you want to achieve in terms of whether you want to be food secure or food sovereign. Okay. Um, you know, from our side as the Agriculture Research uh, Council, our primary focus has been around food security for the country, okay. uh, which is largely around production productivity. Sure. Um, and then from there, we can deal with those other issues. The, the issues around water are very important, and I'm going to combine this particular uh, response to the question around climate change, uh, um, you know, because they're, they're, they're interrelated. Yes, we are a country that is, uh, is, that is water scarce uh, in general. Um, and by the way, but for correction, the Gantt Dam itself, when it started getting built, was more than 20 years behind because the project or originates from 1956. Um, uh, now, in terms of what, uh, what, what water sh shortage and suggestions, I think part of what we're doing as part of our research in the Agriculture Research Council is to begin to explore if we can produce uh, some of those maize varieties or, or crop varieties that actually uh, would enable the plant to produce more plant or more food per crop per drop of water. In, in other words, resource use efficiency, improving the efficiency with which the plant draw the water and grow rather than for them to grow more, more to use more, more water. Uh, so that you, you reduce that particular um, um, uh, aspect. And one of those was the fact that we've, uh, for the last uh, eight to eight years, we've been working on a project which actually is already out there. The farmers are using it in terms of its product, uh, where we ended up with a, uh, uh, a number of maize varieties uh, under a project that we called Water Efficient Maize for Africa, uh, which was to develop maize varieties that are 20% more drought tolerant than any other varieties of maize out there. Um, and this is tar targeted at enabling the smallholder farmer to be much more productive in terms of their yields under drought conditions. Uh, so, so those are some of the things that we are doing. And we're not ju just doing this for the maize, we're doing that for a whole range of other uh, different types of, of crops uh, uh, that, that people are growing and eating in the country. That actually links to the question that was raised around um, uh, 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 climate change, because it's a response that we're trying to make uh, the farmers to be able to be resilient to climate change. Sure. Um, now, remember the impact of climate change is not only around drought. Mm -hmm. There's also issues around floods. There's also issues around the fact that in some instances, your soils change in composition to becoming a lot more uh, salty, uh, salinity, in which case that makes it very difficult for certain crops to grow in the, under those conditions. So how do you change that? Um, and, and then but there is also the effect that climate change also increases temperature. Uh, you've seen uh, much more hotter uh, climates uh, around our environment, and therefore you need to find a way in which some of the crops that you grow 
can actually grow under much hotter climate. So we've developed what we call low-chill apples. So in order for you to, uh, to grow apples, you actually need, uh, under the old system or under the current system, you actually need to grow them in a, in a condition under which they need to be exposed, the, the trees need to be exposed at, for a particular point in time to very low temperatures in the winter. Uh, so that that then stimulates what's called the process that we call vinylization, which then enables them to, uh, to fruit uh, shortly after the, uh, the, the end of the winter. But if the temperatures don't go cold enough, then you're not going to get I mean, the, the, the fruit. So the question is, how do you grow uh, new apples that can grow under warmer climates? Uh, and that's part and parcel of the research that, you, that, 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 we're, do, that we're doing. Now, obviously, that also means you need to also explore ways in which, as you collect in this data and information, you need to advise the policymakers on what, what instruments need to be used uh, to influence behavioral change by us, the population, but also by the farmers. One of those is to encourage conservation agriculture or no-till agriculture and incentivize farmers in terms of the diesel rebates that if they practice no-till farming, uh, the rebate will be higher. But if they don't practice no-till farming, they don't get the rebate. So okay. that's an important policy intervention that you can bring to, to the farmers to influence their behavior uh, and also save costs, but also enable them to get there. That also involves things like precision farming and so on. Um, the informal farmers and database, we get databases based on the various provincial authorities that have some of the information about the farmers. A lot, we're increasing a lot of the projects that we're running with smallholder farmers. A lot of the training courses that um, uh, Tembi runs are targeted at small, smallholder farmers. The, the intention is to try also to influence various government uh, departments to buy from these particular farmers, particularly the, the, the members of Afa, of AFASA. Um, we are not uh, in that space ourselves. Uh, the best that we can do is influence the different government departments that um, these are capable farmers that are produ producing good quality foods and so on. We're running a project uh, together with the Australians uh, as well as the National Agriculture Marketing Council uh, and the Department of Agriculture, Forestry and Fisheries uh, where we have actually brought on board um, your big uh, supermarket like uh, Woolworths and Pick and Pay. Um, and lastly, what we are trying to do in that particular project is to demonstrate to Woolworths and Pick and Pay that the quality of the meat coming from these smallholder farmers that have gone through our training, but also have all, who have also participated in our breeding program for breeding their animals, um, they have producing good quality meat that actually needs to be on their shelves. So we're working on that. It's a project that we're running now. We've been running now for about two, three, three years and so on. Um, you know, um, we have a very open media in the country. And the internet actually is full of a lot of information uh, that is actually unverified. You can say anything and put it on the internet. Okay. Whether it's accurate or not accurate doesn't matter. So um, simply because the food is, is perhaps a GMO doesn't mean um, it is not good quality food. I okay. think we need to understand the science uh, around that. And I would suggest that um, we uh, focus around really um, getting verified scientific information in order for us to, to, to use uh, that particular uh, information. The invitation to work with the correctional services, my colleagues will follow up. Sure. Uh, and then we can, deal, we, can deal, we can deal with it. I think um, the issues around uh, township farmers uh, being productive, I think there's a whole range of tools and techniques that can be used. We're working with the Houghton Department of Agriculture on this particular matter, looking at things such as hydroponic, um, uh, you know, the, you know uh, uh, vertical farming and so on. Okay. Um, so, you know, let me let my colleagues to, to deal okay. with the rest of the questions. Th thank, thank you. Thank you, Doc. Thank you very much. Um, I know that uh, Tsiamo has to rush quickly. Are you okay? Okay, so you can continue with, the, with your closing remarks and ask my question. Okay, thank you, Tsiamo. Uh, I had to allow the doctor to speak first because he's also our landlord. So in case Afasa can't pay rent month end, he will know I've done some favors. 
But yeah, um, in as far as women participation within AFASA is concerned, uh, one of our main, main mandate is to really interrogate the existing policies, right? Because as a farmer myself, who have been in, in, in the business for the past 10 years, I've realized that no matter how innovative you are or how passionate you are, on the policy level, if the, our issues are not addressed, we might as well just leave it. So we're busy interrogating the policies uh, with the intent to influence and make sure that it enables women to participate in agriculture. I'll make a few examples. We're busy talking to stakeholders like COPTA, which is, um, which is hosting most of our rural women. Those rural women, they've got a very valued asset at their disposal, which is land. And most of them, indeed, it is arable land, both in provinces like Eastern Cape and Limpompo. But then you have policies within those stakeholders that are not really conducive for women. So we are approaching them to say, don't box women to 10 hectare size of, 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 of hectares. You have land restitution beneficiaries here who have the capabilities of being active in both in wildlife economy and agriculture so that they're able to be food uh, sufficient and self-sufficient as well and those who have a willingness or capabilities to gradually grow to the commercial space can be active as well. So that's what we are doing in terms of the policy. And the second mandate will be then the resource mobilization, which will be your land, market intelligence, water and finance models. You would hear all the departments, all the sectors, they do have programs for women. But what they have been looked at is really why are we not participating? The criteria on which those programs were developed. Such organizations like AFASA and other organizations were not involved. And it is when we appreciate institutions like, uh, like IRC under the leadership of Dr. Mabuti who is willing to hear and say, how can we improve your participation better as women or as black, black farmers in the sector? The finance models that are there, you would have to have collateral and all the necessary information that is required to be in agribusiness. And yes, again, as women, we've never had ownership to land. Some have never even uh, uh, have access to a proper employment. So we are having a program where we are saying, let's have a coherent a program where we include women from the rural areas and women who have access to finance and say, how do we best collaborate together and make sure that our participation really is, is one that is visible within the sector. And also we're talking to Land Bank to say, yes, you're a commercial bank, but then you need to also consider that you need to play a developmental role in as far as the policies for funding is concerned. So we are working on those programs as well. Sure. And about the climate change, we're also encouraging people to come and say, when you talk of innovation, what are the urban models of farming? Like Dr. Mubudi has already illustrated that there is vertical farming, but also there's so much indigenous knowledge within both rural and informal sectors that, we, that, can, that haven't been exploited yet. I always say, McDonald came with beggars, uh, what is this, Mag and Bean came with food strips, but we also came with Imbizo Chisanyama, that is a female owned enterprise. But how many women are even able to supply those kind of uh, uh, business enterprises? Mm -hmm. So we appeal to women and funders out there and also skills development program to say, how best do we extract value from the money that is spent to this uh, skills program development? Because if we ignore agriculture, then I feel that we, 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 we might as well then just leave everything. Because sure. as we are sitting there, agriculture has played a role in furniture. Agriculture has played a role in what we are wearing, what we are breathing. So it is the main core of our existence. And in as far as informal and rural intervention are concerned, we are busy with the help of uh, IRC to come up with an aggregated procurement platform where we say farmers, whether you're online or offline, whether you have access to the, the smartphone or not, you should be able to gain access. So our approach is that of 
a market-driven approach? What does the market de demands? And how, how, how do we exploit innovation to make sure that it is aligned with the demand and with the research so that at the end of the day, whatever skills that people are acquiring out there, there's value and there's impact in terms of the society as well. Thank okay. you. Thank you very much. Uh, Tiamos, um, quickly um, to close. Yeah. Thank you, Program Director. I'll try to be as brief as possible and try to encompass all the questions into one answer from a highest level as possible. Okay, um, according to, to the question basically that I understood and just putting them together, it was what was the premise to have youth participation in the agriculture sector and how do we ensure youth participation in the agriculture sector? You know, there's been a lot of uh, programs that we've tried to implement over the years, including um, the, your... your, your um, young professionals, uh, 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 wide uh, uh, women in agriculture for research and development. And through those kinds of programs, we were able to ensure that we can mainstream more youth participation into, into the sector. But because of, of, of lack of access to finance, as my yeah. colleagues already said, it has become very difficult for, for young people to get into the agriculture sector. As you know, agriculture sector is not such a glamorous uh, yes. industry. And some of our young people, obviously um, are not, are not uh, tilting or wanting to go towards the sector because of, of, of the unglamorous element of it. Sure. Um, but at the, at the United Nations level, what we've discovered with FAO is that we need to strengthen um, the capacity of young people um, at all levels to carry out and benefit from, from responsible agricultural investment because the investment is, is there, but there isn't enough capacity on the ground. So we are working on training programs, including, like I indicated before, the, the policy that will be adopted uh, shortly uh, in the next coming two months that will provide those direct support and training capacities to mainstream women and youth participation in the sector. Okay. Wow. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can we give it up for the Agriculture and Food Security Panel? Well, there's Dr. Shedrick Nebulo and uh, Tia Mugichaba, as well as uh, Her Excellency Ndutu. Thank you very much for that.